I have a confession. I was tempted to change the subject for this session, but I refuse to be drawn away and enticed. Welcome back to another session of Encore where we continue the conversation around the Word of God. Ed McNeil here with you. Got Pat Yarnell, and this is a special edition. We have Gabriel Skyver with us coming from behind the scenes and out on into the discussion. Good to have you with us, gentlemen. Good to be here. Hey. All right. Well, our subject that I was, I didn't want to be drawn away from and enticed. Is the subject of temptation yet one more time? As Pastor Brett finished the series on temptation, we're just going to wrap up a discussion. We're going to leave it wide open this e for this session. And what I'd like to do is just start into talking about temptation. I don't know where this conversation is going to lead, but the Holy Spirit is, um, is it, it with us. And so let's just get it started. Um, yeah, it's, again, it was kind of like a cool thing to be able to come in at the tail end. You said that there had been a lot of discussion, and this is something that we've been working through through Encore for quite some time. Um, but hearing Brett's sermon, it was unique this week because I was in junior church, so I didn't get to hear the actual message until I listened to it after the fact. But the concept of the, the result of, of Christ's temptation and what it accomplished and uh, how we have that, that true express image of um, if we can live the life of Christ and if we can suffer as Christ and if we are, when we're tempted as Christ was tempted because we're living that life, um, there is power that's accessible in the resurrection and in the actual uh, words of God that will allow us to both resist the devil and repel him, but also to truly draw close to God and become meat for the, the master's use. Uh, so I started to think about just like in my mind, like you said, like what, where have I been and, and what's happened and, and was I always so prepared or did I always have such knowledge of what the life of Christ really was and what God wanted me to be doing um, as I was drawing closer to him in intimacy. Uh, he was always drawing and, and calling me towards him, both prior to my salvation, but I had to do some things. I had to be obedient to the gospel. I had to um, then walk according to the gospel. I had to grow up and start to be taught in the word and, and in the admonition of the faith by the brethren in the body. And so a lot of that involves submission. And as I was thinking through those concepts and thinking about how temptation specifically, how I had dealt with it in the past, present, and future, uh, the word that really came out to me was humility. And what what God has done in consistently in my life, um, before and in the present moment, and I know he will continue to do it as he's sanctifying me um, to grow up into the full measure of Christ, is he is humbling the Christian. He is humbling me. Um, so much of my past life and temptation was trying to, through will worship, as it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 23, like, they have a show of wisdom in will worship and in humility and neglecting of the, f the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Like that was, that was me definitely before I was saved. And it says that it can even happen for a Christian after saved. You can still walk in the flesh, not in the spirit. But um, Christ was doing that work. Christ was, um, I was not always successful in my temptation because of my lack of knowledge. And so then when the faith of God came and the knowledge of that came to me, um, then I knew I needed to be saved. I knew who I was before I met Christ. And I was like, wow, there's a real solution here. There's a solution to my sin. There's a solution to my temptation. And so practically, what I was thinking, and I mean, I, uh, this is what I'm hoping comes to mind for you guys as well, if I was humbled before I could have God draw close to me and continue to reveal his words and reveal the gospel, and then as I was saved, what I need to do both in the present and going forward, that, hum that humility was just always going to be there. And so what are the practical truths of the word of God that I've picked up along the way and has helped me to overcome temptation in my life? Because again, in the past, there was definitely, t I mean, you heard Brett preach it from, from the pulpit this past Sunday. There are those that are just overtaken by the devil at his will. 
in your flesh, when you're in your flesh, you don't have the power to overcome temptation. You don't have the power to flee. I mean, what do you guys think about that? Is that does that make sense? Does that follow? Yeah, for sure. When you're in your, when you're in your flesh, I don't know. I I'm thinking of examples in in my life where I'm seeing people that are hey, they're they're believers, but they're in their flesh right now, and it is. And and the continued failure to to resist temptation, yeah, there's a direct correlation, most definitely, and the humility. It's interesting you you bring that up because I, I do think that's at the crux of this. You start looking at the verses, God either he's gonna you're either gonna humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, or he's going to put you in a circumstance where you have to be humbled or another form of the word humiliated. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that is a scary thought. And I can, I can think about my brother sharing a testimony of a time in his life where he, he said his pastor has always put an emphasis on that. You have to be humble or God's going to have to put you in, a, in, in your place if you want to continue to grow. If he sees you indeed as a son, he's going to discipline you as a son. He's going to, he, he's going to put you through those circumstances for the purpose of correction. So, yeah, I, I definitely, definitely see what you're saying. Yeah, the, um, I can think specifically back to certain choices, especially when I was a younger man. And, I mean, I'm sorry. That's kind of weird. Uh, as a young man, I can remember thinking about, I'm conquering sin. And just the concept of me thinking that it was me that was conquering sin, not the actual life of Christ or, or that commitment of Scripture to memory or that allowing Christ to make intercession through prayer like Brett was talking about on Sunday, that it's truly just being obedient and it's truly just drawing closer to God through that, that humbling experience that actually allows you to overcome temptation. You're not, you're not doing really anything other than allowing yourself to submit and be overcome completely by the person of Jesus Christ, then taking up your cross and turning away the same way that we turned away from the gospel, turning away from whatever sin it is that um, is being set before us by the devil or is in our flesh because there's a stronghold or because of a, a habitual or a besetting thing that we've allowed to take control of our flesh, um, allowing Christ to tear it down, casting out all down all imaginations and every high thing that it exalted its, exalts itself against God. That is what the life of Christ and the Word of God accomplishes. And so the humility specifically I can think of in, in my past was I was convinced that I needed to do something in order to be square or to be righteous or to kind of like overcome that sin or that temptation. I needed to do something. No, um, I didn't have the knowledge of the Word of God. I didn't, I didn't realize that like in Proverbs 15, um, 33, where it says, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. I didn't realize that Christ wasn't gonna lift me up and, and actually allow me to walk in the life of Christ before I actually was completely dead in Christ with that area. I would, I would say it's like uh, the uh, example that Brett would always give of like you conquer one sin in your life and it's like a water balloon. You squeeze it and it just pops out somewhere else. And that was me trying to wrestle with my flesh instead of just allowing the word of God through the memorizing of scripture and through that daily walk and that intimacy and and being humble before God, allowing him to actually bind up that strong man. And then like he shouted, stop. And that stop really just being the, rep- the godly repentance, repentance after a godly sort and with godly sorrow, not, oh, man, I messed up again. I, um, you know, I thought I had this conquered that I'm not going to, you know, talk back to my parents or, you know, take the Lord's name in vain or whatever because I worked at UPS and, you know, just <laughs> shop talk. And it was, it was amazing because God will use the word, his words. He'll recall to your mind, even when you're in living that way and you think that like you're the one that's conquering that, but he'll use the people of God around you as well. I can remember specifically, there was another supervisor at UPS who was a Christian and he literally pulled me aside and he's like, 
you're a Christian, right? And I'm like, yeah. Like, you can just, like, and it was with that tone. And he's like, um, you, need to, you need to get your mouth under control because right now the devil has it. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it was. I was like, do the lean back. But he was right. And I'll never forget because you have the opportunity, and I had the opportunity in that moment to say, who are you to tell me, you know, what's going on or what's, what's happening? Oh, well, the word of God settles the matter. You shall not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. Don't do it. I mean, that's sin. That's an evil spirit that's, you know, coming out of your mouth. That's disrespectful to God. And I'll never forget. Like, it was almost like a light switch. I remember going home and praying about it and confessing it to God and then memorizing some scripture around it. And what do you know? The Bible's true. Like, it was literally that easy. From that point on, I won't say I never swore again, but I will say that the frequency and then the way that it happened was almost, it's almost like it disappeared overnight. And then over time, it was, it was truly, it was gone. I so like, I like what you brought to the table. It's a personal example of overcoming temptation, but by failed, failing. Um, do we see any of those patterns? Well, of course we see those patterns in Scripture. Anything stand out to either of you guys as we talk about failed attempts? Well, going to the um, kind of the, the focus of the last uh, sermon that Brett preached on the results, um, and like you were saying, the, the, the desire to be self-sufficient in overcoming a temptation can itself be a failing and a temptation of the flesh. Um, and so just recognizing that the result that God is looking for is not strictly to overcome that specific temptation in and of itself. And then you have to start the process all over with the next thing that you're tempted by. The idea is the perfecting of the faith so that overcoming one temptation bolsters you already for the next one that you encounter. Uh, James 1, 2 says, my brethren counted all joy. And I, I also think, you, I, I always heard this verse used in a way like you're just supposed to count everything as joy. I, I think it, it gets used out of context a lot. It specifically says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So, um, taking joy in the understanding that the temptation, if, if you respond correctly to it, will work in the perfecting of your faith. But also, uh, to your question, Ed, um, Brett mentioned uh, the example of Peter and how the God knew the temptation that he needed to face in order to be the leader that the church needed um, during the transition in Acts. And I, I thought it was interesting because we know the verse that says, uh, God will not let us be tempted above what we're able to withstand, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Um, but he all, the, the way it was presented was almost like, we know Peter failed, but he was still tempted with that. And I think it's just an example of, that's not to say that Peter couldn't have withstood the temptation, but God saw an area of weakness in him and by allowing that temptation, and Peter even failing, was then able to uh, perfect the faith in a way that he did not, um, at least we don't have a record of him succumbing to the same uh, conditions again. Well, it even becomes like the, it's not so much that God's setting you up because he knows you're gonna fail, and I know that's not what you're saying, it's, it's that he knows the specific areas in which you need your faith strengthened. Like you said, the perfecting of that faith. So when you are faced with that, because God's through grace allowing you to fail faster. Like it's like, this is your besetting sin. You need to figure out how to get this under control and die to it completely like right away. Cause if you don't, you're not gonna be able to do what I need you to do right. here and, and move forward. Um, Cause you need to overcome it when it really matters. There's gonna be a time where it really matters. Exactly. Um, and the Lord has perfect foreknowledge where we truly just have to walk by faith. We have to. It's the only way to please God, and without it, we can't. We can't do that. The examples that come to mind, Ed, is a good one would be John Mark. Um, he he became under the intense persecution as as Paul and Barnabas and him were out there, 
uh, doing their the first mission work and, and setting up their churches and preaching the gospel. And he would just, he couldn't handle it. He's like, I can't do this, I'm out. But then later you hear how he was profitable to Paul. He got right. He he was able to, you know, work with the Lord, and then the Lord was able to teach him through that experience where now he's, again, profitable for the ministry and, and what he was doing. A bad example of, that would, uh, of this where it went south would have been Jonah. Jonah had, you know, tempted to, like, he had a specific mission from God to go preach to, to Nineveh. <clears throat> and his temptation was to run away, and he did. And the worst case was is even as then he went back to do what he knew he had to do. He's like, well, I'm in the ocean, and, you know, obviously I'm not outrunning God on this one. His attitude never really got right, even as he was preaching, because you see how angry he was and the way he responded um, afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's just bizarre to see that again, where if you don't really get this, the result of temptation, if you don't respond to it according to the way that the scripture says we need to, that, that can be us. We can get to the point where we're just never really, we want do even some good things for God along the way or be, or be used of God just because of his utter grace and mercy upon us in which he's going to continue to try and sanctify us and put, in those, put us in those opportunities. But even in the doing of some of it, it never actually hits the full potential where God gets his glory. God is constantly then having to correct us as sons. And eventually, as Paul wrote, if you persist in that, he'll even call you up early. So... It's, it's a serious issue. It's a serious matter um, to get, get lifted up in pride and not remain humble according to the scriptures and get, get our minds really around how to fail fast and how to remain humble uh, as God is through his grace teaching us how to overcome temptation the same way that Christ did. You both, uh, in talking about James chapter 1, you both hinted at something. And Pat, then you said you end up failing faster I've never looked at James 1, verse 2, my brethren, counted all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Many temptations all at once or a series of them. There's a blessing in that, in failing faster and moving past that. And hey, this is not going away unless I deal with it, unless I confront it. That is... That is God at work, and I've never, I never thought about that failing fast as many times as I've gone to this passage, um, whether we're referencing it in Sunday school or in my personal life. That's a powerful takeaway is if you are finding that you are being inundated, is God not trying to push you past this lesson faster? And give you the perspective of, man, I was overwhelmed with this, but here's where God has put me, that my, I may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. And so now someone else is in that situation and I can say, hey, if I, if I will humble myself enough to say, here is my personal situation and here's how embarrassing it was for me, but here's what I'm willing to do. I'm willing to share this with you so that you can get the victory. That, that is why we experience some of the things we experience and to just be able to take those forward. Uh, Peter was mentioned. He went outside and he, he wept bitterly. Like that, that, that level of regret. And we talked about this in the previous session. And just being able to take that and say, you know what? I'm not going back here again. I'm not going to position myself in this way again. So I find it interesting. We're looking at what God is allowing in our lives and is telling us that we're able to handle. But there's also, in this final session, there's also, I was, I was looking at the perspective of Satan's temptation preference. And I put this phrase down in my notes, tempted from on high. And I wanted to just see what you guys thought of this. His, Satan's perspective is he likes to tempt people when they're on high or they're on a high of some kind. In other words, they've done something. They've reached a certain height. They've, they've reached a new level. They've accomplished something uh, they've been, or they've inherited a high position. He's prone to strike you down. And so I want to run, just run through a few phrases here and, and just see how these strike you and then maybe a couple of examples.
When you're in a heightened state, you can see more and you can experience more. When you're in a heightened state, you can feel privileged and entitled. When you're in a heightened state, you can look down on others. When you're in a heightened, heightened state, you are proud. When you're in a heightened state, it's easier to fall than to continue to go up. And then when you're in a heightened state, you tend to rest, you tend to relax, you tend to celebrate, you tend to coast. And all of these things, every one of those are like Satan's perfect setup. So I want you to consider the following men and how they all reached a high level. Here we are coming off a series in Matthew chapter 4 with Jesus Christ. And obviously he's operating at the highest level, but even where he was being positioned on earth, Man, I thought it Brett really brought perspective on this subject when he said that Satan, when he referenced Satan taking him up to an exceeding high mountain. And I thought, oh, there's a heightened state. He's looking down on all of this, and that's when he sets to tear you down. If you will, if you go with that, you pound your chest a little bit, guess what? You're setting yourself up to be knocked down. And he didn't take that, obviously. He didn't take that bait. But David, coming off the heels of, of winning an incredible battle in 2 Samuel chapter 10, then he, here he comes into chapter 11. Here you are up here. At the time when kings go forth to battle, you're, you're chilling. Why? Because I just won a big battle. But guess what? It was the setup. Solomon, man, God has given him all this wisdom, and yet he loved many strange women. Job, man, he, he is considered in a highly esteemed position by all of his peers. Everyone looks on his family and all that he had. God had blessed him immensely. He's in a heightened state and Satan says, that's the guy I want. I want the guy that's up there. Joseph, <laughs> he gets positioned um, even though his brothers tried to bring him down, he's got the Lord with him and he finds himself prosperous, even in the worst of circumstances. But guess what? From that heightened state, here comes Potiphar's wife. And so you just keep going through there. But the one that, uh, that got me, and I, I was having a conversation, my daughter asked a question this, this week. And so in our Bible study, we started talking about this and it, it probably would not, I probably would not have thought of this. But Satan himself, when he fell, where was he? In a heightened state, an unbelievably heightened state. And guess what? In the same place where he took Jesus, in that mountain of God, according to Ezekiel chapter 28. Well, enough rambling on that. I want to hear your guys' perspective on that. I just, this one struck me as, as that whole, and, and one of the things that brought this to light was you talking about humility because if you lift yourself up, you're going to be brought down. And that's not to say you you shouldn't accomplish things. You should accomplish things for God's glory and use that position to better influence people. But if you let pride get to you, look out. Well, it's the whole concept of the heaven opens above and then hell opens beneath. There, These are completely juxtaposed posed uh, situations, the pride of life is going to show up when you're at your most humble because that's how Satan operates. Oh, it, you know, yeah, God did an amazing thing here, but would it have been as successful if you weren't involved? Or like just that spirit of robbing even just a scintilla of the glory of God because it was the work of God that actually accomplished it. It was the spirit of God. It was the words of God. It was his power that allowed that victory to take place. The battle is the Lord's, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're overcoming temptation or whether you're as a body going out and doing that battle with spiritual wickedness in high places under the captain of the salvation, under the Lord's direction. And so, yeah, when you're, when you're up, you're, you're hitting it right on the head. Satan says at the time that God is actually receiving glory, he can't let that stand, not just because he's a being created without fear, but because it, it actually, it infuriates him. Because in the role that he was in previously, yeah. he had so much influence in the carrying on of the praising and the glorifying of God. This little worm, 
this little worm is who God's going to use to get glory? No way. I'm coming in here. I'm, this is my world. This is my house. He's not content to let God have glory. It's not going to happen. That is why he's going to show up there, because he will not allow God to receive 100% glory. But that's the beauty of it is that's exactly how God manages to, to really just tap him on the head and, and put him back aside. Is he, he'll use people who have through um, just obedience to the gospel and their, their senses through, the, through use have been exercised to discern good from evil. And they've been formed and hardened to endure hardness as a good soldier and to, to weather that temptation and to follow that way of escape. And when we do that, God's going to continue to pour his grace upon you, both sufficient for the temptation that you're experiencing, but also to continue to perfect you in the same way that Christ was perfected as he was carrying out his ministry. Even though he resisted the devil at that moment, there was more temptation that Christ had to face all the way up to and including the cross and, and death. And so you're hitting it right, right on the head there. That's, that's something where it is the grace of God that overcomes all of those circumstances. But you have the opportunity. You have the opportunity to, like Satan, let that iniquity get going in you Forget who actually won the battle and whose power it was that subdued all things unto itself. And that humility can, in almost an instant, just even just the corner of it, it flips. And now it's no longer, it's no longer of any worth. It's been destroyed. If you have a, a strong enough moral failing, you've seen how it plays out time and time again. That destroys the testimony of Jesus Christ, and that's why Satan capitalizes on those things. So the failing fast piece of this, yes, you can see it in all of these in samples that are are played throughout Scripture, and that's where my my own life just I remember coming across it as the business principle the first time because every everything that actually works in reality is because of the Word of God said it first, sure. and that failing fast concept. If you're going to make mistakes, please make new ones. And once you know that you're failing, don't keep powering through it like a complete knucklehead, like, Pat, like young Pat. Allow the word of God to take over that. Allow Christ's life to completely subdue that and to through prayer. It says examine yourself daily. You don't need to wait three, four, you don't need to fight that sin for four months and go back and forth. No, you allow the word of God to take over that right there. You confess it and you stop doing it. And if you do that in faith, nothing wavering, connecting back to James, God's going to perform his end of it. He always does. But he cannot, he cannot work with someone who's prideful. You have to be in that humble state. Uh, <clears throat> I, I was just going to say the, the examples that you gave, it's easy to point to David and Solomon and, and recognize where they succumb to temptation. Uh, the two that stood out is um, Job and Joseph, because for Job, his fall wasn't related to sin. His temptation actually came after um, everything was taken away from him, at least everything physically. That, that wasn't a consequence of his sin or temptation. His temptation followed it. And then um, for Joseph... He actually resisted the moment of temptation and then was thrown in prison. And so I imagine his trial, kind of like what you were saying with Jesus in the wilderness, he had a moment that prepared him for a much longer and more enduring ten, uh, trial. So for Joseph to then do the right thing and then maintain his respect and love for God in the face of then being punished based on false accusations for years to go through that fire and then um, to still be found faithful coming out the other end to then be elevated. Um, th there's a, a short verse, everybody knows it, um, resist, resist the devil and he will flee from you, uh, but there's a, a prerequisite for it and it's submit yourself therefore to God 
and it just goes back to that idea that you have to maintain your humility in that you can you can rejoice over accomplishments and you can be thankful and and celebrate but you have to maintain recognition that it's only by God's grace and through his strength that you've made that accomplishment and if you stay in submission to God then you are able to resist you know the 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 temptations especially that are thrown at you when you are on the heights of accomplishment as I'm listening to you in particular describe Joseph I'm literally thinking of this I have the same passage sitting in front of me and I'm getting ready to comment on it and you you reference it that James 4 7 submit yourselves therefore to God is it possible there's, there, there's no possibility for Joseph to do what he did if he was not already had not already submitted his life to God to be able to resist the devil and to flee and he'll flee from you how nigh to God how near to God was he to be able to be cast in prison and still keep his testimony and not let that uh, phase him in any way. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. That, that, I can't think of another verse to describe his, how strong you had to be in that moment. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Watch out for the double-minded where you're wavering back and forth. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord, but it's be afflicted, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Listen, he went low, but God lifted him up. And when he lifted him up, it was an amazing thing. In the biggest failing temptation of my life, in the midst of the summer of wondering of all of the consequences of it, my aunt, and I've referenced this before, my aunt went to the library. I don't know if I've referenced it in an encore. I've certainly in a Sunday school classes. She went to the public library and she purchased something. It's called a cassette. <clears throat> And that cassette was a, of a Reverend T.D. Jakes. And on there, the message was, can you stand to be blessed? And what a clever title for, for the message itself. It was exactly what I needed, but it was, can you go through the trials? Can you go through the tests? Can you fail and let God use that process while you're down to pick you back up. Can you stand? Can you stand through it like Joseph did so that you can come out on the other side and be lifted up and be blessed and use that as a testimony back for God? I have, that, that message was probably one of the most powerful pieces to help me through that. But it was like, man, when you're in the midst of the storm, you're going to have to stand. And, uh, and, and that is the description, Gabriel, that you just gave of Joseph and certainly what scripture would uh, co corroborate with uh, man. That, that's a powerful passage. A couple of other passages come to mind about this humility. Romans 12, 3 says this, For I say, through the grace, you referred to the God's grace doing this, grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. What a powerful passage and a reminder of our perspective not to think more highly of themselves. I had somebody, a coworker, one time talking to me about some kids and it's some teenagers in the neighborhood, uh, some other parents that were struggling with this kid and like, man, like I just don't think she has any self-esteem. And I just, I said, you know what? I just wonder if she has too much. Mm -hmm. She just thinks too highly of herself and it just kind of took him back. Like he had never heard that perspective. That's, that's because it's a, it's a spiritual perspective. Uh, Galatians 6 Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, our only responsibility is to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. And, I, and, and here's your perspective. Considering yours thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another bur burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. 
then it says this, for if any man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. This is the beauty of, of so the t- title of the sermon series was Alone, right? Yes. And you have to have a life of private holiness before you can have a public testimony because the private mm-hmm. always is reflected in the public. Mm-hmm. But um, once you have that right relationship with God and you and Christ has taught you how to subdue your flesh, to put it to death, to mortify your members, and how to, to walk in the same ministry of reconciliation that he, he modeled for us, mm-hmm. you see that he had the disciples with him and he was investing that life into them and then they were catching it as they went following after that same testimony, and then they went together, and they, they were also then going into different towns and cities and, and preaching this gospel of the kingdom, um, different gospel than what we preach today, but exactly the concept of they weren't alone. You're never, you and God are always the majority, as preacher would say, but God's given us specifically this body of believers, this church, in order to help us overcome those temptations. And also, when we are compromised by our own temptation, like we can help restore one another, like you mentioned in the Galatians verse. But you even see the practical like results again of a body that is able to detect where the body is being tempted or where individuals are being tempted and how we can rejoice or where the consolation comes from overcoming that temptation. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. Verse 1, it says, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife and vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, that humility of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This was what Christ did. He came as a servant to show us that model. Yeah. He didn't need to. He, didn't, he had been lifted up, like you said. He, was, he had every right to rule and reign as king right then, but because he knew what we would suffer, as Brett had talked about in, in previous sermons, he had to model to us while we're in our flesh how to be servants, not just um, unto Christ, but also unto one another because it's that like-mindedness of Christ, that like-minded life of Christ that actually gives God all of the glory. Because if we are focusing on the life of Christ and the person of Christ, you are nothing because Christ is everything. You're not going to do better than Jesus Christ. You're not going to overcome temptation in some way that Christ didn't overcome temptation. And when you actually understand that, You're not going to look at a fellow Christian and be like, I'm better than that guy. That's not the standard. The standard's Jesus Christ. Yes. And you'll never overcome temptation if you don't have that like-mindedness and that unity that we're called to through those passages and through that mind of Christ. That's quite the connection between that and the Galatians 6. That's a perfect passage, that Philippians 2. The brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, Restore one in the spirit of meekness. You you can't. Oh wow! I can't believe so and so. Like no, that that like mindedness is absolutely necessary. So listen, the expectation is if I come to my brother, they're not going to. Oh man, I can't believe this guy did this. I can't believe this guy fell like this. Like come on, that can't be the perspective. That's why it says we need that like minded spirit, and and, and that's why. He warns, unless you are, you're going to be tempted also. Don't take that approach or that attitude. But the, re, the other reason I believe it has to be this passage is here and, re, and is a reminder to us on how to handle this when someone finally does come to us, because we can't restore someone that won't speak up. If you can't admit that you have an issue, if you can't admit that you have a problem, if you can't take the time to share with a brother in Christ and say, you know what, here's where I am, I'm embarrassed, I'm going to need some help here. If you can't start there, there is no restoring because there's no knowledge of it within the body. But once that does come up, that's why the Bible is so delicate on this. They just for their heart. They just put themselves in a vulnerable state. They just humbled themselves and wished they had previously 
humble themselves, but now they are there. Let's help them. Let's build them up. What a, what a powerful, powerful testimony for a church that has a body of believers that have been restored because of how that body of believers has handled that circumstance. We are um, wrapping up. Any uh, other thoughts? I, I would say that I always go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7 thinking about, about how we overcome the power of the flesh, even as a Christian after, after we've um, been walking with Christ for however long. Um, we got to remember that we have promises, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. That's, that's a commandment to us. We have to do it in the power of Christ. We have to do it the way that Christ did it, with his life and with his words. But the word of God is what will actually overcome this. And it says, let us cleanse all ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Receive us as we have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. That is the mind of Christ. We are here to speak the words of God unto you in humility, in like-mindedness, in one accord with love, and then because of that, we'll die. We're dead. We're dead in Christ. I'm crucified, crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live the life of Christ. We're here to live the life of Christ with you. We are here to overcome the devil and the temptations that are going to come and the persecutions that are going to come and the sufferings that's going to come. This is the power of the resurrection. Um, I was just going to point to a, um, a reference in Hebrews, looking back at the children of Israel. Um, where he, he writes, whereas the Holy Ghost saith, so th the idea is, this is an example of how not to respond and the, the potential consequences of being stubborn and prideful and, and not being humble. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So if you respond in a, in a prideful and defiant way, mm -hmm. you are risking, I mean, it, it, not to say that you can commit a sin that cannot be forgiven, but a hardening of your heart in a way that can do permanent damage or at least make it much more harder to respond appropriately. Uh, so that the warning ends, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Um, and just kind of going back to when you were talking about Jonah, the idea that even though he finally did what God told him to do, his heart attitude never changed. And God's not going to bless you with the full blessing of doing it for him and as to him versus strictly out of being forced to because of the circumstances God put you in. Um, and then just uh, one more verse uh, from 1 Peter. I, I can only assume that or infer that he's writing from experience um, the, the appropriate way to respond. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, mm -hmm. though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the, the appearing of Jesus Christ. So I said earlier that the result we're looking for is the perfecting of our faith, but the reason we want to perfect our faith is so that we can bring praise and honor and glory to God. That's good stuff. Great passages to end on. I was going to say, uh, mention something about the book of James, but I'm going to um, just work through it very quickly. The book of James is a, yes, it's written to the 12 tribes, but as I looked back through for this final session on temptation, that book 
is a lot about temptation. James 1, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And it talks about a man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when it finishes, it brings forth death. James 2, don't play favorites based on status. Don't treat somebody that with money differently than you would, or someone that doesn't have money differently than you'd treat somebody that is, has wealth and maybe status. Don't be tempted that way. James 3, the tongue. <laughs> Don't let your, the tongue is that unbridled member. James chapter 4, from whence come fightings and wars from lust within your members. Ye ask, and ye ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. Man, James chapter 5 though, the way that chapter ends is really powerful because the answer, the way this whole, all after four chapters of various temptations, it ends on the note of prayer. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Confess your faults. Here it is, one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Gentlemen, thank you for a great wrap-up to a number of sessions and a series that Brett presented on temptation alone. The truth is you're not alone. You have a body of believers, and even outside of the body of believers, you have Jesus Christ, and you and God are a majority Thank you for tuning in to Encore, where we continue the conversation around the Word of God. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.